Hello everybody, welcome to my channel, The Real Super Sam. Today I have a fun superhero show video and I hope you enjoy. X-Men Evolution is one of my favorite Marvel shows. I grew up with it. I remember watching it on, on Marvel.com. My whole life I have loved the X-Men, mostly because of the movies and this show. Growing up, this was my first X-Men I knew of. This was my introduction to the world of the X-Men and this year I rewatched the whole series. I had more fun watching it then when I was a kid. Probably because I knew all the characters now and it wasn't my only introduction to them anymore. And I enjoyed it so much that today, well here is my list on the top 10 best X-Men Evolution episodes. This was the first Marvel show of the 2000s, premiering November 4, 2000, and it ran for 52 episodes, making it 4 seasons. This premiered right after the movie ended its box office run, introducing many, many iconic Marvel mutant characters and creating very interesting and unique storylines for, for them to be in. One of the best things for me is the show didn't focus on Wolverine that much. Maybe one episode centered around him per season, but when it was on Wolverine, it was one of the greatest Wolverine in, in media I have seen so far. Since here, yes, they have him being a badass and tearing things apart, but, and probably because the cast is younger, it showed him being more of a leader and guardian figure. This show also had the best Cyclops and Jean Grey animation. I say that because Cyclops is really, really likable here and is the leader behind Professor X. Jean Grey also isn't just perfect or useless until the Dark Phoenix arc, which never happens in the show. Some members were introduced later than in the original 90s show, like Beast and Gambit. Unlike X-Men and Spider-Man the animated series, none of the episodes were based right off the comics. The show aired on Kids WB, and the show was a little bit too dark for them, but thanks to high ratings, the show got to keep going. Actually, something interesting is that this show is set at a time where superheroes are very new in the Marvel Universe, so the X-Men are secret. Them having powers is secret, unlike the comics where in public they would fight their enemies. There's even an episode called Walk on the Wild Side, where it's made a big deal that some mutants are using their powers to help people, being vigilantes. The X-Men were changed to be teenagers, and they went to public school and lived at the Xavier Institute at their school called Bayview. Other villain mutants were there to conflict with them. One original character that they made for this series was Spike. He's probably the biggest one in just the show continuity. Who He has the powers of this mutant called Mero. At the start of the series, he can barely control his powers, and by the end, he has physically changed and his powers have evolved. When the show adapted some complex themes of being different in Season 2 and even more in Season 3, I think they did it flawlessly in my opinion, and it wasn't too... Uh, too serious or trying to make some sort of real world message that much. Another original character that was created, the most popular one is X-23, who's in the live action movie Logan, and she's in only about two episodes of the show. She has a cameo in the very end of the series, but we'll talk about that later. So this show is the only X-Men TV show I've watched so far. It was my introduction and still one of my greatest X-Men media that I've consumed. Since I haven't read many of their comics, with that said, here's my list on the top 10 best X-Men Evolution episodes. Number 10 is Episode 4, Mutant Crush. Here is the first appearance of Fred Dukes, aka The Blob, in the series. This is the first episode of the show I remember seeing, and I still find it really fun. The episode starts with showing Fred Dukes as an attraction at a monster truck rally, and everyone laughs at him. That always makes him mad, so Mystique is there and recruits him, bringing him to Bayville High. There, he gets laughed at by everyone, making them furious, but there is one good thing, Jean Grey, the one person, a pretty girl who is nice to him, he takes it a bit too far, quote unquote a bit, and kidnaps her, leading to a fight with the X-Men. Rogue is a big part of this episode, as her and Scott Summers have to work together on a school project. We get hints that she has a crush on him, but is scared to tell him about it. Although she sees that the X-Men look out for each other, and even in the end, absorb Cyclops and Blob's power to rescue Jean, ending on an uneasy but better relationship with her and the X-Men. And I think Blob was done really, really well, a lot better than usual when it comes to his character, because you do feel sorry for him, and pretty he's pretty sympathetic. Number 9 was episode 35 called Blind Alley. Cyclops has always been my favorite X-Man, and this episode is all about him. The episode has him without his glasses abandoned in the desert and having to survive and get back home, all while Mystique is hunting him, torturing him, trying to kill him. The episode starts with a montage of all the X-Men rebuilding the mansion after, well, something happened, and then Cyclops gets a call from his brother Havoc to help him in another, uh, you know, part of the country, or I think it's another country, I think it might be... New Mexico, anyway. But it was secretly Mystique, not Havoc, who called him. This is the darkest episode of the series, at least in my opinion, and there are many threatening moments that Cyclops has to deal with. 
the main thing with this episode, looking at, at the whole series, is that it basically finished our Scott Summer, Jean Grey romance of Will They, Won't They plot of the series. From what I heard, since I haven't really watched the 90s show, there's an episode or at least a big moment like this in that series, but it's really done better in X-Men Evolution than in Taz. In Season 3 and 4, the Xavier Institute becomes more of an actual school, and after this episode, Jean and Scott become kind of like teach. they actually do become teachers and students teachers at the Professor X Xavier Institute and students at Bayville still. All right, a sad note to include is his voice actor passed away last year, Cyclops' voice actor, on November 18th, 2020. Kirby Morrow. Number 8. Episode 24, Operation Rebirth. This show didn't really have references to other Marvel characters outside of the X-Men universe. The biggest one was in this episode, and the guy was Captain America. In the episode in present day, he is still frozen in ice, and we see him through flashbacks during World War II. They did this because Marvel pressured them to include other Marvel characters, so they had Nick Fury and Captain America here. And in a latter episode in Season 4, they had the Rogue Viper. The stuff that I love about this, these episodes is the surprises, like how Cap is still frozen in ice in modern day, and the stuff with Magneto, how Wolverine and Captain America saved him from a camp during this, that time and place, and even the surprise of Magneto using his powers as a boy to save them. Reminds me of the live-action movies, though. That was probably on purpose since this show aired soon after the first movie. In present day, this continued Magneto's last appearance, where it's shown that he survived the season 1 finale and is still going after mutants to recruit them to his cause. Why he needs this project, the reason this is happening, and it's all kind of out of nowhere and feels a little lazy writing. The episode is one I like a lot still, because it is an episode that is very unique compared to the rest of the show, and this time, that was a great thing. And it was really cool to see Captain America, and I like how the flashbacks were all, you know, mostly still, eh, not exactly black and white, but, you know, it was easy to compare present day just by colors, you get what I mean. Number 7. Episode 14, Growing Pains. This is the second season premiere, which starts with the change of this show, what will make it the really show the greatness the series can produce. Not only does this episode introduce the new mutants, but Iceman is with them, and their brotherhood are against the X-Men again, fully in costume. For a season premiere, it's fantastic. It starts with the mutants saving lives, then questioning on whether they should use their powers or not, and things happen leading to the Brotherhood of Mutants exposing that mutants are real, and that characters like Scott Summers and Jean Grey and Professor X are all mutants. The main theme of this episode is hiding their mutant powers since the public will reject them when they learn they share the Earth with mutants. For example, Cyclops uses his powers to save a school bus and the media questions where this mysterious beam came from, almost like it was like some sort of threat. Deanne has the Brotherhood go against Mystique's orders last season since she's gone now, and they publicly reveal that they and the X-Men have powers, leading to a big fight between the two groups. And even after, you know, all the chaos, and I think specifically what happens is Jean Grey saves their principal, and he just like kind of shrugs it off, trying to get away as fast as he can from her. This episode, while airing, had the scene where Avalanche is nearly killed by falling debris that's on fire. This episode aired September 29th, 2001. So, for the event that happened on September 11th, 2001, they removed it from the airing premiere. So, to, yeah, the close of the episode sets up the return of Magneto, I won't say how, and Senator Kelly becoming a political leader against the mutants, and yeah, Senator, uh, not Senator Kelly, I guess, but just Kelly is the principal, the new principal of Bayville High School, because in season one, it was Mystique. Number six. Episode 32, The Stuff of Heroes. In this episode, the world is deciding on what to do about mutants and to help their case or hurt it. The X-Men find themselves battling Juggernaut for the second time. Here, the X-Men mutants have been hunted and ostracized, having to hide in the public and stay in a cave for their safety. Beast and Storm confront Congress, I guess, on the rights of mutants, and while this is going on, the Juggernaut has returned. Since this is early in the Marvel Universe days, Superheroes definitely aren't commonplace, and I think it makes more sense because in the comics with characters like Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four, well, Fantastic Four kind of were changed to be like more celebrities, but with the public not exactly hating Spider-Man as much as they hated mutants, it kind of didn't make sense for them to be, you know, completely ostracized because they have powers, but then other characters like, you know, I mean, at least it seems like Iron Man has powers, and I would say the Hulk, but Hulk has, you know, General Ross and the Hulkbusters, but that's going completely off topic. I don't know, the way the show did it was really well, and I also like the response to this from Wolverine being to automatically fight back against the humans trying to, you know, go after them, but Cyclops is a lot tamer than what 
you know, than that one confronted. The fight with the X-Men and Juggernaut is one of the best fights in the series, especially in a moment with Cyclops removing his glasses. Also, since Professor X isn't around, Juggernaut has been lost since the end of or because Professor X has been lost since the end of season two, and this is season three, episode two. Anyway, we get to see how strong Juggernaut is even without his helmet. This was Juggy's last appearance in the show, but man, was it memorable! And one thing I really like is almost all of their attacks are kind of like team-based work, like. Storm and Rogue and Iceman and Spike, etc. You get it. And it's, you know, really, really creative. And they do this all while saving the public because Juggernaut is destroying a dam because he wants to do it. I forget why. Also, one thing in the show, they make Juggernaut a mutant in the show. They don't have his powers come from a Ciderac, you know, the demon Ciderac that lives inside this ruby that he has. That gives him powers. No, he's just a mutant, which I guess is a lot simpler, but a little bit less creative. Anyway, number five, episodes 51 and 52 called Ascension. Oh, yeah, the first two part episode on the list. This was the series finale where the X Men and Brotherhood, plus more, all work together with plots and character relations that have been seen throughout the last four seasons. All together to save the world from Apocalypse. I also really like Apocalypse here. He thinks that his destiny is for him to evolve the world this way. And then changing everyone into mutants in like a snap of the fingers. And that's it's what he's, he's been chosen to do. This episode starts with the confrontation with Mesmero who has been working the free apocalypse since season 2. They learn that his plan is ready to evolve the world into mutants, except when he does this many will not survive so the X-Men are working together with all the help they can get to shut down Apocalypse's plan which is, he has three pyramids and a sphinx that he has bases in and he has a bunch of technology in them which I've, I'll explain a little in a little bit how he has this futuristic technology. If you know the comics you know what I'm about to say soon but uh... Yeah, it goes all the way around the Earth, and it is just insane. At first, when I first saw this episode earlier this year, I didn't like it as much, but now watching it again, wow. It is very impressive, and in a twist, Apocalypse reveals his four horsemen, which are Mystique, Magneto, Professor X, and Storm. They've all become more powerful, especially Mystique. She can now transform into water and multiple animals, and this was a big surprise when this happened because originally it seemed like Apocalypse had killed them all. If you are wondering what I was not, what I was referring to just like a few seconds ago, yes, Apocalypse's origin does tie into Ramatut here, aka King the Conqueror, and I like that. This is the reason he and his horsemen have tech stuff all over their bodies, but I prefer the classic design of Apocalypse more, though this is a great reimagining. And I also like how the voice actor for Professor X does the voice of Apocalypse also. I think if Apocalypse was to really talk to another character, they would have had that other character also do his voice kind of like he's a dark mimic of uh whoever he's talking to but that's just kind of my my theory in this show he can grow into a giant and such but he never really does anything more violent than just wave his hand and cause things to disappear in a glistening flash of light i guess since he is all powerful in the comics the only person more strong than him in marvel is galactus usually so him not really having to fight with his fist it, it makes sense or at least him not wanting to since it was the finale, I'll talk a bit more about this stuff at the end of the, of the video, but the relationship between the Scarlet Witch, Quicksilver, and Magneto comes to a little end here. The Sentinels have their return here also since the Season 2 finale and help attack Apocalypse and his machines. I also like the sort of revenge Rogue gets on Apocalypse here, and to me, the surprise on how they stopped him for good, well, was a real big surprise. I did not expect it to be that easy in a way, but you'll just have to watch it. I really don't want to spoil this insane ending. Also, a little bit this doesn't really matter for the episode, but uh, the end credits are usually like the X-Men theme song all upbeat or not, but the end credits for um, the last two episodes are like really dark and s kind of sad and really mysterious. Like, I don't know. It's a really cool touch-up that they did. Number four, episode two, The X-Impulse. Yeah, this is just episode two, and I think it's really good. This episode was the introduction of Kitty Pride, Shadowcat, and Avalanche, whose name is changed in the show from Dominic Petros to Lance Alvers. Lance Alvers, Avalanche, okay. It was also the first fight scene with Wolverine in the show, and he fights his old foe, Sabretooth. It was also the first episode to use an actual lyric song. As the second episode, it still is introducing us to the mutants for this series and building up the teams of the Brotherhood and the X-Men. This episode starts with Professor X's cerebral device locating Shadowcat 
and then him and Jean Grey travel there to recruit her for the Xavier Institute. At the school, Kitty Pride meets another mutant, Lance, who can cause earthquakes with his powers. He's an orphan who is a troublemaker, and he swoons Kitty into helping him steal the exams to papers to make a profit. When it comes to Wolverine, he and Sabretooth have this really cool fight in a parking garage, slamming cars at each other, and even Cyclops and Nightcrawler join in, but Sabretooth still escapes. In this show, it started out with Cyclops and Jean Grey, Jean probably being Professor X's first student, and Storm being a teacher at the Institute. Then they recruited Nightcrawler and Wolverine came back, returning to the X-Mansion. This episode was all about recruiting Kitty Pride, and the process of finding out you're different with these powers and struggles with it, the opinions with it, and even changes that come along. This episode also starts the relationship between Shadowcat and Avalanche. This lasts throughout the whole series, even though earlier in the show, it was her and Nightcrawler, but then that kind of plot is forgotten, and in the comics, it's her and Colossus, and they only make a reference to that in the Season 3 finale. Anyway, I think it is the most entertaining relationship in the show. At the end, Shadowcat joins the X-Men and Avalanche gets recruited by Mystique, both of them going to, uh, uh, gosh, what's it called, Winchester? Yeah, that's what it's called, Winchester, where the X-Mansion is, in Bayville High, and they both go there for the rest of the series. This is one storytelling way that I appreciate this show doing. At the start, it shows Nightcrawler late to class and the principal nagging him about it, and a little scare when she grabs his watch that changes Nightcrawler's appearance to be human. Then we don't see her until the end where she recruits Avalanche to the school and then transforms to her mystique look. It is a good way of establishing context with her and her plan for people who skipped the first episode. As much as I've talked about it here, I think this is a better episode to start off with if you want to start the series. Or if you want, don't want to start the whole series, you just want to watch important episodes, yeah, this is definitely a better one to start with in episode 1. Hopping into everything almost as well. Number 3. Episodes 29 and 30, Day of Reckoning. This is the second and last two-parter on this list. The season 2 finale was so many shockers that while watching it, I was on the edge of my seat every second. The finale was an introduction to so many fan-favorite X-Men characters. Colossus, who starts out as an enemy of the X-Men here. Gambit, who was a hero since the beginning of the 90s show in animation. Pyro's here. The Sentinels are here, and Bolivar Trask. They all make their first appearance. The story is the X-Men become pushed to the edge by Professor X to stop Magneto's plan, whatever it is, and even has them work with their Brotherhood, who just beat them last episode thanks to their new teammate, the Scarlet Witch. Then, Magneto's acolytes attack and Quicksilver betrays the teams, leading to a Sentinel rising from beneath thanks to Magneto, so the world will have proof that mutants exist. In the episode, there's a big confrontation with Magneto from the Scarlet Witch, which almost, le which apparently leads to Magneto's death again. With the X-Men and the Brotherhood teaming up and facing Magneto and his four acolytes, with the first appearance of the Sentinels, there's only one Sentinel here though, and it shoots out lasers, flies, and has a claw hand, and it bests Wolverine, and Magneto later gets it to attack the X-Men in public. They probably already guessed that part. This event had the confrontation between Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver also, since in this in the uh, series and I could have added episode 28 but that wasn't exactly like part one it was kind of like a part point five to this two-part event because in the, in this series the Scarlet Witch as a kid could not control her super powerful you know mutant powers so Magneto had her locked up in like in a you know penitentiary ever since she was a kid I think 6 to 16 she was locked up there and Quicksilver kind of just stood by and let it happen and that was a really really interesting origin for the Scarlet Witch and I remember like yeah this was the first time I ever Heard of her, so... Yeah. Okay. One of the coolest things is the ending. What the whole season ends on. The X-Mansion gets blown up, destroyed. The world knows of mutants now. And Mystique has been impersonating Professor X for the last three episodes. They did a great work with this, as Professor X physically comes into the rooms in the last two episodes to talk to the X-Men, when usually he would telepathically communicate with them. And Mystique has Jean, and Mystique asks Professor X has Jean Grey use Cerebro. This two-part finale was great and had so many memorable moments with its characters. It had a giant cliffhanger which changed the rest of the show forever also. Number 2. On Angel's Wings, Christmas is my favorite holiday, so I was pleasantly surprised that there was a Christmas episode for the show, and it was the introduction of Angel, who only appears in two or three more episodes. He is a superhero mutant who helps civilians and is considered a real-life miracle from God from the public. It works perfectly since this is the time of year for those type of stories. This episode has the Angel being noticed by Professor X and Magneto, as Magneto causes Angel to accidentally bump a girl off a bridge, turning the public against him. So Magneto then tries to get Angel to work with him, but he refuses. He refuses to go to the Xavier Institute also, 
but with Magneto attacking him, he worked with Cyclops and Rogue to beat Magneto. Ultimately, with the little girl he saved, there was a lot of lovely emotions here. There was a moment in the final fight where Rogue actually takes some of Magneto's powers, and they have a fight across the city skylines. And another thing about this episode is Rogue. She has a crush on Scott Summers, yeah, but he still just sees her as a friend, and Jean still has feelings for him. And Magneto returns from the season 1 finale. I can't think of a problem I have with this episode. Definitely better than the 90s Christmas episode. A thing I really like is there is a Daily Bugle reference in this episode, the only one in the show if I remember. Anyway, rewatching it, I enjoyed some parts and noticed some really subtle great details that I didn't before when it comes to the animation. And, yeah, it surprised me, especially for early 2000s show. I guess in the early 2000s, you know, so to say long ago, I don't really expect much, but so when they do kind of go an extra mile in a way, I, I really enjoy it. Anyway... This actually came on December 2001, 20 years ago. So, this was the Angel's first appearance at Christmas, The Return of Magneto. Of course, this is an episode I remember now for the rest of my life and enjoy. I might even watch it every, you know, kind of like watching an episode like Christmas with the Joker from Batman Taz or the second Sinister Six episode from Spectacular Spider-Man. This might be another, you know, Christmas-themed cartoon episode for superheroes that I watch every year. Number one. Oh yes, I knew it, I knew it. It was always going to be this one. Ever since I was a kid, I've loved it. So yes, there is a lot of bias here. But I'm saying it's Episode 9, Survival of the Fittest. Ever oh my gosh, even the title is great for what this, the plot is. Ever since I was a kid and first saw this show, and even when I started to think about this list, yeah, I was 99% sure that this would be number one. In fact, it was this episode that made me love the character Juggernaut, definitely more than the, the movie X-Men 3 did. Both episodes with Juggernaut are on this list because he is just such a strong villain and kind of underused these days. In the show, they make him almost unbeatable. He kind of gets beaten cheaply in this episode though, as the mutants just take his helmet off and Professor X knocks him out. The plot is the X-Men students and the Brotherhood are at summer camp and the two mutant groups go head to head against each other, specifically to a race to the top of a mountain with a flag up top. When they make it, Storm alerts them that Juggernaut's about to hurt the Professor and Mystique. They all go to the X-Mansion and all work together. They each have their time to shine, taking down the Juggernaut and removing his helmet for Professor X. This is the episode which it has the last 8 episodes built up to. After doing the villain of the week thing most of the time, they all were here and they all bounced off each other to provide the best episode of the series. Their Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, specifically Toad, were, you know, really good comical relief. Yeah, yeah, obviously I'm a little biased, but uh, honestly the best parts are with the characters, which this episode was all about, and what the entire series was really about, why I thought it was so great. There's also a lot of, like, three sections. One is what Juggernaut doing, and he is doing, and he just, like, tears through police cars, and even a train is running by, and he just walks through it, basically. So there's one thing with Juggernaut. There's another thing with the summer camp thing. There's another one with Professor X and Wolverine and Storm kind of, Trying to make sure no one follows Juggernaut to the X Institute for, or you know, the X Mansion for attention and um, for Wolverine. He also has a little bit of a one on one fight with Juggernaut, but he just throws him through the walls. And it reminds me of when he threw uh, Wolverine through the ceiling and then he comes down again from the X Men 3 fight between the two. So it was really, really good. And of course, they referenced that they're brothers. They actually say that Juggernaut and Professor X are brothers, not stepbrothers. So again, a little bit so to say, dumbing down the Juggernaut character's origins for this, but I guess it all works out. He just really needed a big, strong villain for the show, and he was definitely the second strongest compared to Apocalypse. But uh, yeah, again, it was really smart. Like I said, I had no idea that they would be thinking about, um, you know, having Storm make the whole area foggy so no one could really follow Juggernaut with a news copter and, uh, you know, etc., etc. They also have Juggernaut locked up, in before this episode so you never really get to see what happens between uh him and professor x's first fight i guess they must have had a first fight to get him locked up and the security he's in is like a really big deal they also really focus on how mystique had to go through a lot of trouble just to break him out but uh yeah and she did that because she wanted to get the cerebro device from professor x probably to help locate more mutants faster for her side but uh I'm saying but a lot. There's a lot. I could tell you everything about this episode, but another but. Some other day. Honestly, a 10 out of 10. I remembered so much about this my entire life. Actually, there was a time I thought 
the this episode was actually like two different episodes. I didn't think the summer camp episode was at the same, you know, in the same episode as the Juggernaut first appearance. Anyway, anyway, I'm not going to listen to honorable mention. I really wanted to put episode 47 on here called No Good Deed, season four, episode two. But there is a lot of plot holes, and it was just one of those one-off episodes in season four that never went anywhere. And because of that, I couldn't find myself liking it enough to be put in the top ten. But I definitely recommend it. You know, I really like the Brotherhood in the show. They provide the most episodes with the rogue battles and comedic relief. And it was the only time I remember Avalanche, the Marvel villain, in. Thanks to the one-off episodes developing each character, it worked really well to make their characters interesting. This was a really well done series. Perfect voice acting, especially for Jean Grey, Cyclops, and Professor X. And I think this is the best voice for Shadowcat also. The overall series storyline was amazing, and I really wish more programming nowadays was like this. It's shocking, since this was half a decade before the spectacular Spider-Man cartoon. I mean, I think this is a really overlooked show, but definitely has a place in being one of the great, greatest Marvel cartoons. For me, it has not been outshined yet, to me, from what I've seen. I like this more than the X-Men Taz stuff. And we'll probably still care about this after I've binged Wolverine and the X-Men this holiday season. I think that the 90s show gets so much praise. And again, from what I've seen, is that this show Evolution is better than the 90s. Especially the series started to improve as it went on. At least when it had overreaching storylines. It's even a little bit timeless. A perfect cartoon. Really fun to watch. Man, I'm kissing this show's butt a lot today, huh? Some of the episodes I didn't like. Uh-oh. Were the ones where Storm had to deal with her old tribe or something? That storyline was never really resolved. They didn't give Storm justice in the show. Actually, she wasn't an only child in the show either. Or was she? No, wait. No, definitely. She wasn't an only child. She was uh, She was actually this new character, Spike's aunt. So I guess since Spike was a new character, they changed out for her as well. Anyway. There was an episode where Shadowcat... Founded, you know, she finds this new character called Danielle Mooningstar. She's a powerful telepath who can even mess with Professor X. They make an episode to introduce her, and then she never shows up again. It's the episode right before the two-part season finale, and they kind of did the same thing for f the character Forge. He was in episode 6, and that was his only appearance, if I remember. One of the things when they introduced them was when they introduced the Morlocks. At the end of that episode, they didn't do anything with that guy. Uh, this guy was going to continue making the poison and mutants. It was a soft drink, but the soft drink, he didn't notice at first that it was poison and mutants. But then when he did find out that it was poison, he just was going to continue to make it. And they didn't do, any they didn't do anything with that. Although, speaking... Although, okay, maybe I should say this first. Because when it comes to that guy, couldn't Professor X... Like, Professor X believes him when he says that. He says he'll stop. But obviously, he's not going to. So why didn't the professor just read his mind to be sure? Since this is poison... Uh, but with the episode, they actually did the Morlocks a lot better, I think, than in the comics. And like I said, I've barely read the comics, but from what I know, Morlocks are done better in the show. At least in the early days. They also built up some new mutants, but they didn't do so much afterwards besides just kind of fight. Like, especially for Berserker. Anyway, the episode I hated the most and slash liked the least. I mean, I was watching it again. I'm skipping this episode. I'm not even joking. Whew. It was called A Drift. It's in Season 2. It's basically Cyclops and Havoc or in a sea storm. And that's it. Really boring. Okay. So, so some positive stuff. This show did one thing that the other shows did not have not done. No Dark Phoenix Saga. Though it was alluded to with the Apocalypse. His plan was different from the comics in the Apocalypse episode. It was alluded to. But I'll talk about that moment a little bit more. In the Apocalypse, his plan in the episodes was different from the comics, I think. Where in the comics, he wants to destroy humanity or make them his slaves. But in this show, he wanted to advance this, you know, human evolution, X-Men Evolution title. He wanted to make it, you know, advance quicker to make everyone a mutant. That was his big plan. I really like that change. If I was to rank the seasons worst to best, it would be season four worst, season three Season 1 and Season 2 best. Based off my list, you probably have assumed that I liked the one-off episodes the most. Since that's where the series shined for me. Gave episodes I remembered almost 20 years later. A lot more, uh, just fun memories. That's where the shows and writers slash creators shine. Showing character and growth in 22 minutes. 
The last two minutes of the series basically gave us a look at what Season 5 could have been. It had a reformed Magneto teaching the new mutants, including a return at Jubilee since she left in the beginning of Season 3. Jean Grey transformed into the Dark Phoenix, and had the series continued, yeah, the next season would have focused on the Dark Phoenix saga. It would have had the future X-Men team, consisting of adult versions of Cyclops, Nightcrawler, X-23, Iceman, and it would have had also Beast, Shadowcat, Colossus, Rogue, able to fly, and she's not wearing gloves, and Storm. The uniforms these future X-Men wear look very much like the dark uniform seen in the Ultimate X-Men comic, as well as that of the live action films. Anyway, it had the adult versions of the Brotherhood, including Pyro, join Shield, an attack fleet of Sentinels led by Nimrod through Bestgen and Master Mold. It was suggested in the end of the. I think that was the last shot of the future talk Professor X did. And the next season was also going to have Emma Frost and Psylocke. Um, there's actually concept art of them online. So, X-Men Evolution became the third longest running Marvel cartoon behind Spider-Man the Animated Series for 65 episodes and X-Men the Animated Series for 76 episodes. The show's producer, Boyd Kirkland, says his favorite Evolution season is season 3. This show then gave birth, so to say, to a new series, Wolverine and the X-Men, which began airing in November 2009. It was not a continuation of X-Men Evolution, though the same creative team was behind the show. Craig Kyle, Chris Yost, Stephen E. Gordon, Greg Johnson, and Boyd Kirkland all returned to work on this show, Wolverine and the X-Men. In 2012, Jean Grey and Robert Kelly, voiced their respective X-Men Evolution actors, appeared in the Iron Man Armored Adventures episode, The X-Factor. By the end of the fourth season, the show was deeply immersed in the X-Men lore, settling into a groove and growing darker. The decision to cancel it resulted in a shorter than normal nine episodes fourth season. Taking this show as its own canon and realizing that it was aimed for specifically younger viewers than X-Men 1994, I think you will agree that this cartoon did this Marvel property really well. What I wanted from the show in Season 5 is more with Senator Kelly and a better wrap-up with the Scarlet Witch. Like, she came out of the series loving her father even though it was Master Mold, or sorry, Mastermind, gosh, who changed her memories, but I think the show ended very well from what I saw, is that this show was supposed to end with Season 3, not having enough for content for season four but when they were able to make a season four they kind of changed that and they were also going to do a season five but of course uh it didn't happen so they were going to keep building up the apocalypse story arc in the season five but uh yeah just a f nine episode fourth season so you're probably wondering if i'm going to break the fourth wall yes i have never made a top 10 episodes list before so hopefully it was entertaining and you all liked it. For my next unique video topic kind of like this, a movie review for Batman 1966, and for the next top 10 episodes, Spider-Man the Animated Series. My final thoughts are that, man, we need more cartoon series like this. Much, much better than the cartoon shows we have today. Why can't we get any more great kid slash adult loving shows like this with original hand-drawn animation? It was a definition of a forgotten gem. So thank you guys so much for watching and have a great day.